So as I've, I've grown older, I've made the mistake of continuing to handwrite notes for speeches. The downside of that is that they, my handwriting is becoming increasingly fuzzy, and I'm not sure why that is. Um, but I'd like to thank Matt and the board for, for having me here today. The last time I was here, we were trying to pin it down. It's over 13 years ago, and you guys have done an impressive amount of growth and done some very impressive and important things. So I need to admit that I don't have an MBA. My degree is a Bachelor of Science in uh, Applied Math and Computer Science, which, well, completely qualified me to run a multinational, multi-million dollar corporation because I had never had any business courses. Um, but the thing that, my actual business experience came from doing things like consulting, and I started consulting in high school, and that went really, really well. And then in college, for a summer job, I went for a small, worked for a small company, and the president ran off with the secretary and all the money, leaving his wife behind and us. And the senior employees started the second company, which I worked for, and then they ran out of money and let me go. And so I went back to consulting, which went pretty well. And after that, because some of the consulting I had been doing was for clients of Hewlett Packard, Hewlett Packard offered me a job and I worked for them. They were an absolutely spectacular company at the time. Um, and then they moved my division to California, and I didn't want to go to California. So I went for, to work for a small company called ALF Products, which was friends of mine from high school, and they ran out of money. And so it was like, they had a choice, right? They could lay me off or one of their board of directors, and so you might guess what kind of decision that would lead them to make. And so I interviewed, and the first two companies that uh, I interviewed for said I didn't have the requisite skills to work for them. And so this is, for an introvert, this is like vastly demoralizing. And so I thought, well, I'll just like, do my own thing again. That is the only time in my life when things have actually gone well. And so I started a company called Quark, and I borrowed $2,000 from my parents. And 19 years later, I sold it for, yes, a reasonable ROI. Um, and retired for a couple of years. I snowboarded, I traveled, and then just for fun, because I had to have something to do while my husband had a career. Um, I started a little social networking site called connection.org. And then just recently, I, actually in the last year, I've decided that I'm going to try once again to uh, do the whole business thing for profit. And so I started a company called JSTAR. And we're kind of doing it backwards. We're doing it backwards because um, the CEO, Alex Caposalatro, is sitting down here. He is 27, and he is the CEO, and at 61, I am the CTO. And this seems like exactly the opposite of the way they do it in Silicon Valley. So I'm hopefully that, hopeful that by being contrarian in that way, we can actually do something that's in, incredibly good. We have a really cool team. Um, but. And this is where the whole problem with the fuzzy eyesight comes in. I learned a couple of things from my time in, at Quark, and I'm going to share them with you because they're short. And one thing is that focus is incredibly important. You have to pick something. The other thing, which is that not being focused is incredi incredibly important sometimes, and that's because you have to adapt. The product that ultimately made us successful was supposed to be a word processor and by the time it shipped, it was a desktop publishing program. You have to iterate because version 1.0 never sells very well. Well, with the exception of the iPhone. And <clears throat> it wasn't for us until version 3 that we actually got traction. And we, we got to $300 million in sales annually with 60% pre-tax profit. Um, and I was kind of, sort of, in charge of marketing, which, as a math major, I can tell you I had lots of experience. Um, but I learned a couple of things. 
that are really, really important, and that's that you win when you can make other people win with you. And so we won because we found other people who could be developers who could work with us, and they could make money when we made money. They became, in essence, what I call a free sales force. And that was really the key to our success. It was a collection of free sales forces, a large group of people that worked together in order to make all of us successful. That consumed my life for 19 years. And then I did the whole retired snowboard thing. But in the middle of that, they passed something in Colorado called Amendment 2, which eviscerated all laws that gave any kinds of protection or sucker to, that's not the right word, but, um, or maybe it just sounds funny, to LGBT people. Um, and so I got pissed off. I got like, well, I got depressed first, and that doesn't, didn't last very long. So then I got pissed off. And my business partner, who noticed me somewhere between depressed and pissed off, Fred, um, Fred is Persian, Iranian. He calls himself Persian. Um, he had to flee Iran when the revolution happened. His wife is Cuban. She had to flee Cuba. And so they know what discrimination is like because they came to the US where they were discriminated against because of the home countries they came from. And so Fred said to me, Tim, you should give a million dollars to convince people that, that discrimination is wrong. And I said, gosh, that's a lot of money. Um, so I am a mathematician, but I, and I, like, I love numbers. I just do not love numbers when they represent dollar figures. <laughs> um, and so I had actually never bothered to balance my checkbook. And at one, so at one point I came across a statement and I had a million dollars sitting in my checking account. So this is where like, that business background might have helped because it might not have stayed there quite so long. But that was kind of the big, my awakening into philanthropy. And it takes a life-changing event. And for me, it was the passage of Amendment 2. It was knowing that the assistant to my, one of the assistants to my staff had voted for Amendment 2, that her husband had worked to pass Amendment 2, that Amendment 2 would allow someone to be fired because of their sexual orientation. And so my first vicious response was, I'm going to fire her because of her sexual orientation. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I realized we have to be bigger than that. And I wasn't going to fire everyone because of their sexual orientation anyway. Um, so it would really be kind of transparent what had happened. But the thing I did, so you, know, you don't get training on how to be a philanthropist, typically. Um, my parents went to philanthropic events. I know that because they, they dressed up nicely and, and got the babysitter and, to take care of us. Um, but I never really knew what they were, and I never really knew why. And one of the things that meant was that I didn't really know how you give away money. And the thing that's really easy about giving away money is it's really easy to give away money to someone who asks. It is really easy to give away money to something that is generically good. What is not easy is giving money away in a way that has impact. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to diss some things right now, because there are things I do not give, away money, or give money to. Um, my alma mater. I've written some checks to support the LGBT organization, but my school has a reasonably big endowment. Harvard has an unreasonably big endowment. And if you give money to something like Harvard, Yale, any of those organizations, they will thank you if you give them multiple millions of dollars, they will have a dinner in your honor, and no one's life will be changed. The most important thing you can do with your money is deploy it in a way that changes lives. And let me tell you what that means to me. And it means a couple things. It means the same thing, actually. I hated the idea of politics. Um, when I started the Gill Foundation, I said, 
apologize because it's dirty. I'm going to do this all with C3 dollars. Um, and it turns out that that actually doesn't work. But what you can do is give away money to people to whom it makes a difference. And if, if you look in the political sphere, because that's like the most concrete and easiest to talk about, is giving a candidate to, money to a candidate who is really good on our issues but is going to lose is a waste of your money. Giving money to a candidate who is good on our issues and is really going to win is a waste of your money. The only time your money matters is when you and your friends put your money together and you make the difference between winning and losing. We've won at marriage. We've won because of a lot of people. It's because of Arcus, the Bonnet folks, the Haas Jr. folks, the ACLU. Um, if I could make an entire speech just listing the people that helped make that possible, you can also just buy Mark Solomon's book, Winning Marriage. Um, and he has about 10 pages of people that he thanks in the back, and those are the people that we owe marriage to. Um, don't you hate it when you, when you go off script and, and lose track of where you were? <laughs> but let me give you examples of some of the things that, that helped us win marriage, and let me tell you what the next fights are going to be about in the US anyway. Um, we won marriage in Iowa because we, uh, let me say, we is, we is not me, it's not any necessarily one of those organizations, it's not any particular donors. There were, have been so many people involved in the fight, it really means we the community. And we the community are vastly different than a lot of other communities because we have no leader. We don't have a Martin Luther King. We do not have an Elie Wiesel. We do not have a Cesar Chavez. We only have us. And we only have us working together in concert to make this happen. So that is the definition of we. Um, we went into Iowa and worked with the governor there and used local organizations on the ground and got him to support, to appoint appropriate people to the Supreme Court so that the Supreme Court of Iowa ruled in our favor in marriage. The opponents were not amused and proceeded to try to get rid of the Supreme Court. They did get rid of some of them, and they proceeded to try to convert both legislative houses into Republican control so that they could repeal the court's decision. We, mot we got all of our donors to focus on a small number of races in Iowa that let us hold on to the Senate by one vote. And Steve Gronsall, the head of the Senate of Iowa, for years of us supporting him, turned back the attempt to delete marriage from the statute, from the, well, from the laws, if you will, of Iowa. We did different things in different states, and in the end, how many of you were here last year? So you saw Kevin Jennings talk last year. What he said in his speech was that 17 states had marriage, and now, one year later, it's 50. But he also said that one year ago, 29 states had non-discrimination that covered LGBT people. That number is completely unaltered. Our mission over the next however many years it takes is to make that change. And it's not places where we can use the tactics we've used before, because we can't flip legislatures in Alabama and, and Georgia into democratic control. We have to do something different. And we have to do something that, in fact, you can help with. The only thing that lets us talk to those legislators is business. They care about the business in their state. They want their state to be profitable. If you are based there, if your company is based in one of those states, you can help deploy lobbyists to convince those legislators that their state will be better off if it has non-discrimination ordinances. So that's where I encourage you to put your time and your treasure 
It's the thing that will make the difference for us. And we have marriage in New York and in Iowa and in every other state where we initially had it, not because the Iowans stepped up, they did, not because even the New Yorkers stepped up, they did, but it's because the people in Georgia, the people in Texas, all of those states were giving money and giving their expertise and making it so that those of us who initially got marriage could get it. We owe them. We owe them big time. We have to go into those states and we have to make sure that they have the same protections that those of us in the 21 states that have protections enjoy. It's actually a few fewer if you're trans. Um, and I encourage you to give money in that way. If you look in a lot of those states, Georgia, Florida, you'll see things, organizations like Texas competes, Philadelphia competes, or not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, and those are organizations that have been created in the last year in order to make that possible, in order to be able to organize business in a way that can impact our rights. Support them, support the, the legal organizations that are fighting for us. It is a different world. It's a post-marriage world, and the tactics we have used must change. And I could use your support, all of us can use your support, and we really owe it to the people who have got us to this point to make sure that they can join us in the light of day. Thank you. So that speech was somewhat dissimilar from what I had written down. Uh, <laughs> but we have time for a couple of questions, I think. Someone like choke themselves when I'm supposed to get off stage. So whether it's about business or, or gay rights or snowboarding, I am perfectly happy to answer any question. Hmm. Yeah. Um, David Baker from Oxford. Um, you talk about uh, making those changes in the 29 or 31 states um, individually. What work are you doing or should we be doing at the federal level with either ENDA or the, the new law that's, that's coming out that's a little bit harder to get bipartisan support for? Yeah, so I don't work at the, at the federal level. I don't work at the federal, and I'm glad there are people that do um, because it's largely dysfunctional. You, some of you might have noticed. Um, which doesn't mean that we won't get something through there eventually, but for us, the focus remains on the states exactly for that reason, is because we know we can do something. And, you know, it's not like politicians really want to be out and lead on these things. They'd rather follow. So to the extent that we can get their states to adopt these kinds of measures, it becomes a lot easier for them to be the follower, um, and it's less of a risk to their political career. And, you know, in a, in a way, you have to have these conversations with people. You know, as an engineer, I want to say, I will explain the logic of why gay people should be treated equally, and you will understand, and you will just change your mind. And somehow that doesn't happen. Um, and so when you have these fights, not all of which we win, you're having a conversation with the American people. And one of the mantras I had when I was at Quark was, never advertise your competition. Right? So you don't mention them in ads, you don't bring them up in speeches. Um, you should know about your competition and people ask, you should be prepared to answer, but you don't bring them up. The other side has this terrible habit of bringing us up. And so they're actually moving the conversation forward when they do that. I loved when the governor of Indiana went on, on television and tried to explain um, their anti-gay law and everyone was looking at him going, really? And so when they do that, they're doing us a favor. It doesn't feel fun at the time, but they're advancing the conversation for us too. Yeah. Either, either one, I'll get you next. No, you, you go first, you go next. <laughs> Thanks, uh, I'm Wynne Chesson. Thank you so much for your generosity to our movement. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm really curious to hear your take on 
once we've won legal equality in all the ways that that's possible, how do we get the next step of, of lived equality? What's your right. take on, on that, making that jump? Yeah, so I, you know, I don't think there's a magic button for that. The thing about the fight for legal equality, it's, it, does, it, it advances the conversation. When we have these fights, people talk about the issue, and people talking about the issue is, is the key to that. It's, the, it's making them think about it and making them change their mind. It's a generational thing. When my dad's generation dies off, when each successive generation dies off, you know, modulo some terrible event, um, we are better off. And so I'm a huge fan of doing anything that talk, that brings this issue up as long as we don't hurt people in the process. Um, we're going to be in the middle of a big fight for the hero um, law that was passed in Houston. We have a very short period of time to make that. It was challenged in, uh, with petitions and it's going on the ballot in November. And so this is an opportunity for us to have a conversation with the people in Houston about LGBT rights. And right now, it's, the last poll was 52 for and 47 against. Um, that's a really narrow margin. Um, on the other hand, if it were 64, 60% for or 60% against, it wouldn't be worth, worth playing in. But for those of you who get approached about contributing to that, um, I think it's, it's a risk, but it's probably a good risk. And someone back there was. Hi, I'm Marco Chan. Uh, uh -huh. I'm actually Wynn's classmate, so naturally we have very <laughs> similar questions. Uh, as a follow-up to that of lived versus legal equality, what, what are the pieces of evidence or what is the logic model that leads you to believe that non-discrimination laws versus other laws or other policies are the most impactful for um, the well-being of LGBT people in the US? Um. <clears throat> Well, it's not necessarily. So the thing that my political team gets charged with is I say, I don't care what you get. So whether it's a non-discrimination law, whether it's a anti-bullying law, any of those laws, you should get the one that's easiest because it moves the conversation forward, it protects people. Um, if it's a choice of two things, you should get the one that protects the most people. So I don't believe it's just non-discrimination, but you do have to build um, an apparatus that, because you've got to test messages, you've got to test messages locally, you've got to test messages nationally, um, and so you don't want to be too splintered in your approach, but typically when you're going in talking about non-discrimination, you can get other things as a side effect, and you should never be so stupid as to not get those things if, if they're a possibility. Yeah. Hi. Oh. Um, my name is Kendall Tormina. Oh, hey. I, I'm a student at Rice University in Houston, Texas, mm -hmm. and I'm so pleased to hear you talking about the Houston Equal Rights Ordinance. My partner actually worked on Texas Wins for the last six months. Yeah. Um, so I'm thinking yeah, about... Yeah, we helped found that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, I'm thinking about the way that um, marriage came to many states and then eventually through the federal level. Mm -hmm. We finally got it in Texas, too. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering the work that we're doing to get lived equality, to get non-discrimination um, in Texas. I'm wondering if it's really... It, if it's more about really winning that fight locally in Texas and in Houston, and how much it might be about changing the culture um, of the country at large, because it seems like that was part of the how marriage was won. And, and I heard Mark Solomon speak about uh, the book, and it, mm -hmm. that seemed like a huge part was changing the culture to get it at the federal level. Is that kind of part of the part of the the strategy? Yeah, I mean, so it's again the thing that the engineer doesn't believe you should have to have co conversations. Um, the introvert doesn't think you have to have have that either, but um, no. So we go in, and I, I take no credit for um, the good work that was done in, in getting Hero passed. Um, it's a, it's a, it's going to be a tough fight, but 
It, it's going to be our, it's really our first fight after marriage, and so it's certainly one I would like to win. I really don't want to put any wind in the sails of the opponents. Um, because it's going to get attention, and people are going to talk about it. And that's what changing the culture is. Because I think, by and large, once you can get them past the fear message that the other side attempts to instill, um, the American people are fair and rational and logical over the long term, kind of like the, the financial markets are fair and rational and logical over the long term, but, but not on you know, certain Tuesdays of the month. Um, so it's, it's just that. And to move that conversation forward, we'll do it at the local level, we'll do it at the state level, we'll do it using business leaders. I don't care. I only care about the result. I don't care about the tactics as long as they're legal. Yeah. Hi. I'm Claudio Pagani. Mm -hmm. I come from Anderson. Mm -hmm. I might not. It's not a question. Um, I come from Italy, mm -hmm. and it's a thank you from the international community for setting up the bar high in terms of gay rights and LGBT rights. It's just a thank you very much. It makes a difference for us in our home country, and it will set the example. Thank you again. Thanks. Yeah. John Stryker and Arcus are, are focused on that. Uh, international in the specific, there's so much work to be done there. It's a very daunting task, and it's not going to be accomplished anytime soon. So. Um, so it looks like this is the, you're done, Tim, no more questions. <laughs> so yeah, I'll take yours, and I'll answer in like 10 words or less. Yeah. So, for those of you who didn't hear the question, it's how do we is how do we deal with international um, issues? And in particular, y you get people who come and work in the U.S. for a while. They're protected, and then they potentially go back to their home country. In this case, India, where the protections are they vary actually in India a little bit over time, but they are not good. Um, and so the answer is you just have. There's some people that, are, that have to work there, and there's some countries like Uganda and Nigeria, which are very, very hard to work in, where it's life-threatening to work there. Um, the, one of the most wonderful things that was done this in the last, um, during Obama's term, was Secretary Clinton's speech on gay rights or human rights. And it put the international community on notice that the U.S. was going to press on that. And for us, for me, with a fairly comparatively small budget, our budget is anywhere between 16 and 18 million dollars a year, international is hard. For the U.S. government, who can get countries to moderate their laws, that is huge. And so for me, lobbying the U.S. government to push for our rights is in potentially the most fruitful way to make that change. So anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate your attention and time. <laughs>